This conference will now be recorded. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the RTD Accountability Committee Governance Subcommittee on Monday, October 5th at uh, 2020. So we'll call this meeting to order. Um, Melinda, I might ask you just to read, just for the record, um, the list of attendees that you have. Uh, you want the full list or just uh, committee members? No, full list. Okay, you got it. So we have Melinda Stevens, Ron Papstorf, Ashley Stolzman, Barbara McManus, Bill Van Meter, Deborah Basket, uh, Dea Zavala, Douglas Rex, Elise Jones, George Gersel, Jackie Malay, Jordan Sanchez, Julie Duran Mullica, uh, Kathleen, I'm sorry, I don't see your last name, Kathy Nesbitt, Luke Palmazano, Lynn Geisinger, Matt Callison, Miller Hudson, Natalie Shishido, and Nicole Carey. Great. Thank you, Melinda, very much. Are there any names that were that uh, Melinda did not read off that are present? Doug, can yes. you hear me? Yes. It's Angie Rivera Malpietti. Hey, Angie. We got you. Thanks. Great. Is that Kathleen Brackey? I don't know if she hears it. I just see a Kathleen. Yes, it's Kathleen. It's okay. Kathleen. Thanks. Thanks, Kathleen. Appreciate you. Sure. And I put it in the chat too, so you'd have it oh. for the record. Thank you. Thank you very much. All righty. Uh, agenda hey, item hey, number Ron. two. Oh, Ron. Hey, very sorry to interrupt, um, but I did want to take the chance because uh, Rebecca White's not on the call today, but Natalie Shishido is on the call today. So Natalie was just recently hired by, by CDOT as a um, a fellow and um, so Natalie's going to be helping out Rebecca White um, and will be assisting us with some of the research activities and so forth uh, in support of the RTD Accountability Committee. So I just wanted to introduce Natalie since she's new to all of you and um, you'll be seeing her at many of these meetings. Great. Thank you, Ron, very much. I appreciate you doing that and welcome, Natalie. We're really looking forward to working with you. We're going to put you to work. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited to be here. <laughs> Great. And um, I will also say I want to thank CDOT as well for for uh, providing this uh, resource to us. Um, seven committee meetings a, week, a month. We uh, we need it. So thank you very much. All righty. Agenda item number two is the September 28th meeting summary. That's there for for your review. Um, if there, you have any additions, just welcome to share those now, or just shoot myself or Melinda an email, and we'll make sure to make those changes. There's no extra required to that. Um, we do have two two detailed items today that uh, we want to talk about. First was um, in response to a, a uh, request that we had at the last meeting to talk a little bit about the um, the Board of Directors district map. And as as we all know, they're they're planning on going into a redistricting redistricting process in 2021 or after the census that they're required to do. And Bill Van Meter, God love you, Bill. Last minute, Bill um, uh, was uh, was invited and and he accepted to come and give a little update on their process. And um, you know, we talked a little bit about kind of about the history. Uh, Julie, this was kind of in response to your request, and we talked a little bit about the history and how they were formed, and Bill kind of in general knows a little bit about the history, so we're still looking into that a little bit more to see what we can find, but um, but without further ado, I might just go ahead and turn it to you, Bill, and, and you can provide those updates. Melinda, can you sh uh, allow Bill to share your screen? I believe I did. Bill, did oh. you see that? Yeah, I see. Please close confidential windows. Okay, I'll, I don't have any of those, so... <laughs> um that's good and in theory i will get there uh of course i press some button that now has everything in a different place oh well it says i'm sharing am i sharing can you see a presentation yes yes, yes. 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 awesome okay so yep um Fortunately, I also have Barbara McManus, again, Bill Van Meter from RTD. I am uh, Assistant General Manager for Planning at RTD. And if I can figure out how to actually start the slideshow, I want to take you through the, the, the basics, the um, requirements and the process that we'll be going through over the next couple, well, year and a half or so. Uh, for 
board redistricting. First, this is the current director district map. 15 districts, each district designed to represent approximately, at the time, 180,000 residents, um, plus or minus. It wasn't perfect in terms, there are some that um, districts that represent more than 180,000 and some that are less, but this was the director district map. It says 2020, it was based on the 2010 census and adopted by the RTD Board of Directors in early 20, 2012. So that's the current map. Um, hit, quick, quick piece of history, and um, and I'm doing this a little bit out of order, not not practiced on giving this presentation, but it was nine, an, a vote of the people in 1980 that changed the board from a 21 member appointed board for RTD to a 15 member elected board. So that vote happened in the general election in 1980. The map was drawn, and in 1982, the 15 member elected board was seated. We had thus a 1980s map, a 1990s map, a 2000s map, and a 2010s map. This is the 2010s map, again, even though it's titled 2020 Director of District, it certainly is still the same and has been the same since early 20. 12. So we've had four versions of this map historically. I was able to find a in a similar format our previous one, the one that was adopted in 2000, well in 2002 based on the 2000 census. So I have the current one and its immediate predecessor. Um, so that's a little bit of the background and historical perspective. So the general requirements are laid out in the Colorado Revised Statutes for RTD, 32-9-111, um, um, election of directors, dates, and terms also lays out um, the requirements for our district. District, I have it sitting in front of me, and if, if anyone wants to hear a recap of that, I can provide it, but much of that information will be shared in the course of my PowerPoint. So, Every 10 years, director districts must be reviewed following the federal decennial census. And a, an apportionment is made to the extent possible on population. And if that map is not adopted by the RTD board of directors before March 15th, two years following the decennial census, in this case, March 15, 2022, the state legislative council will create the map for RTD. So the board has a process established for making sure that we comply with the redistricting of our boundaries prior to that March 15, 2022 date. That process is that our chair will establish a redistricting committee. That's one of the things that our chair will do in the early part of next year, uh, establish a redistricting committee. That committee will update the current director district map based on the new census data. So first thing we'll do is just compare. Do we need to make any changes at all? RTD's enabling legislation doesn't, doesn't specify, does not specify what that allowable variation between districts in terms of population should be. But we try to use state law, which says a 5% deviation above and below, below between the most and least populous house districts. So we, we, we make a valiant attempt to follow that as our guidance as well. Um, the director districts only need to be redrawn if the population difference between any two director districts exceeds a threshold to be established by the board. We certainly expect, based on district growth, that that will be the case. It has been, as far as I know, 
with all four maps that have governed um, the district to date because of population growth. Um, we'll be over on average 200,000 people because we're expecting the decennial census to come in solidly over 3 million people within the RTD district and 3 million divided by 15, pretty easy for me to do on the fly is 200,000-ish. Um, we have seen from the state demographer's office, Dr. Cog's data, um, general estimates, we haven't thrown them into the map yet, but we know that the south, the east, and the northeast of the metro area have grown more rapidly than northwest and west in general. So the impact will likely be that director districts on the western side of the metro area will grow in geographic size to incorporate enough population um, to fall within those bounds, those established bounds, and that those to the south, to the east, and to the northeast in particular will likely shrink in geographic scope because there's more population in those districts. That's an a priori assumption, and the actuals will be based on um, census data. A few more things on process. Consultant assistance will be sought, sought to assist in creating the district map. That's been our modus operandi for the last two. I was here for um, the uh, 1990, although I wasn't uh, watching that very closely at that point in my career, and the 2000 and the 2010 processes. Um, we've had consultant assistance to help us with the mechanical tasks of drawing and making sure that all of our rules and criteria are being followed as we develop maps. Districts must also be comprised of whole voter precincts. State requirement there makes some sense, so every precinct um, needn't be split in terms of ballots. Uh, one of the things that we anticipate, um, once again, will be a charge to the committee, will be that all directors, all sitting directors will be kept in their existing districts. So we aren't going to redistrict any director out of a job. We will develop alternative scenarios for the map. They'll be created and reviewed by the districting committee and staff, and the committee will review alternatives recommend an action for the full board. A couple other quick notes on that process. We have in the past always consulted with board members. They have kind of core constituencies, I would assert, all 15 of them. And um, we make extraordinary efforts to make sure that their kind of core constituencies, not just their home address, but their core constituencies still are or, and will be represented by them. We also endeavor to have as few jurisdictions per board member office as we can. That's one of the sub criteria that we consider. In other words, we don't draw a boundary for a director district that includes four counties and 18 jurisdictions. Um, that would be a very difficult job for any elected official to uh, report to and keep track of what's going on in the, that many jurisdictions. So uh, those are some of the other guiding principles that we use typically during the process. In terms of next steps and timeline, we will form the redistricting committee early part of next year. The census block de group data, which is what we'll um, use to ascertain population by district, is also scheduled to be released in the early part of 2021. The redistricting committee will review that information, meet with directors to in determine individual preferences, second and third quarter through the summer of next year. 
finalize the maps in the fourth quarter 2021, first quarter of 2022, and bring that recommendation to the board of directors in early 2022. That's our planned next steps and timeline. Historically, our districts have not changed radically um, in terms of their geographic coverage and which jurisdictions they represent. Again, there has been, at least in the past couple, and again, we anticipate again now, a, a slow migration of the center of the district, if you will, to the east, definitely. Um, at times, it's been more of a southward movement. This time, we expect it'll be um, perhaps maybe a little bit more of a northward movement in, where, in terms of um, what those impacts will look like. We'll sit back and see. But the districts do not change radically in terms of their core constituencies, and that's by design. So um, just to kind of emphasize that fact, and um, I apologize that I didn't get this out in advance, only found it fairly recently. Again, this is the 2010s, 2010, 2012 through 2022 director district map, our current map. And if I um, can navigate my computer, I'm going to pull up in a few moments and maybe even make an attempt at making side by side. I'm not sure if I can do that. Um, the previous, its immediate predecessor, and you can see that um, the geographies are very similar between the two. So while I'm doing that, I will assert that my um, presentation is substantially over. I'm happy to attempt to um, answer questions. There's the previous one. Can I do side by side? I'm not sure that I have the capability to. Yeah, we... um, I will, will. I will distribute this to through the proper channels to Doctor. Thank you, Bill. I think we may have lost you here for a minute. Log staff. Oh, We're yeah. still in the process of trying to find out. That's completely at all. So I, I will, at, at that point, that's kind of the information that I'm prepared to share. We'll attempt to handle questions as best I can. And like I say, I have the um, the, uh, the statute for the article, the articles from state law, the RTD Act that lay out the specifics on drawing boundaries. I have a question. Yes, Elise, go ahead. I'm just curious how the number 15 was arrived at back in, did you say 1980? And how that number compares with other transit agencies across the country in terms of the number of board members? Yeah, in 1980, um, a number of state legislators were frustrated with the governance structure of 21 elected or not elected appointed board members and it was a state legislative decision um, ex state legislator and director jack mccroskey was the key architect of that legislation is my understanding and the rationale for 15 i cannot tell you i know anecdotally that it's a slightly larger board and the boards of many of our peer agencies. Great. Thank you, Bill. Yes, Julie. So I have a quick question. Um, so over the, the course of the history of RTD, um, how have cities been added or, or has been removed for whatever reason? So for example, if there's a, a new community that wanted to be included, in the RTD district this next round? How does that work? Okay, so the original legislation for RTD defined uh, way back in 69, um, defined the boundaries and it actually included all of Weld County, all of Adams and Arapahoe County, 
and all of Douglas County. Um, very quickly, um, and it's murky to me, but very quickly, a number of, of jurisdictions and counties de-annexed from RTD back in uh, the before Bill Van Meter time at RTD. So Weld County de-annexed the southern 75% of um, Douglas County and the eastern two-thirds of Adams and Arapahoe County counties, those that weren't urbanized or expected to urbanize ever. There was a law, I can't recall, um, a change in our not, not in our legislation, a law, I believe, for all special districts, but it certainly impacted us that was passed now many years ago. That law states that if any jurisdiction is wholly or partly within RTD, any new land that they annex is automatically included in the RTD district. So, Brighton and um, Erie and other communities have annexed property and land in Weld County. Those portions of Weld County are now part of the RTD district. Um, there have been annexations to the east by Aurora. Those, those properties and those plats um, annexed after the date of this legislation, sorry, I don't know off the top of my head when that was, um, are part of RTD. And so on the fringes, particularly to the east and to the northeast, there are random parcels um, that are part of the RTD district, not all of which are even contiguous with RTD because of that law. Um, there need, if otherwise, um, I wish I had the document in front of me, I'm sorry, um, but generally if and a property owner or a group of property owners in a neighborhood want to annex in, they can petition RTD to annex in. Um, if it's a larger agglomeration of population of peoples, they need to vote on entering the district or not. Similar for de-annexing. So Castle Rock a number of years ago had a vote do we want to be a part of the RTD district or not? They, um, de because at that time they were partly within and partly without because they had annexed into RTD. And so any subsequent annexations by Castle Rock automatically became part of RTD. They had a patchwork quilt of neighborhoods that were and weren't part of RTD. They had a community-wide vote the vote said we wish to de-annex from RTD and they left RTD. So for large agglomerations of people, the process is a vote of the people to annex or de-annex in. Um, small individual properties owned by a single property owner or something like that, they can petition the RTD board of directors um, to join. And so just, this is, hey guys, it's Jackie Malay, Lone Tree Mayor. Sorry, I have no video available right now, but, um, my community was a poor when the city of lone tree uh formed a portion of the city was in rtd and a portion was not in so we consider the biggest vote after the vote to incorporate the uh the vote to bring all of the city of lone tree into the rtd district um and i believe that vote happened i is to, would 2004 sound appropriate for that uh, i believe and when lone tree voted to annex into RTD, there was no service. We didn't even have, there was one bus that was happening, but we recognized kind of the vision for our community was to have the light rail extensions and to actually see light rail extended down into the, at least the Northern portion of Douglas County. So uh, we, we still in, the, in this community are very proud of that vote um, to join all of RTD. What one frustration with that vote is that we've we flip flopped back and forth where our entire city has sometimes been in H and has a portion of it has been in H and a portion of it has been in G. Uh, we have not been represented by the same uh, board member, which maybe is good or bad. But I guess just for our sake, Bill, as you're redistricting, can you keep us all in one? Can we stay united now? We'd like yeah. to stay that way. 
<laughs> All right, um, request noted, and um, we'll pass that on to the redistricting committee. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Dan. Yeah, thanks. So this might actually be a question for the operations committee, but since I'm in the governance and I'm on the call right now, I will ask it. Um, Bill, how does this redistricting ultimately impact um, bus operations? Like, I think what Jackie just mentioned was a great example. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, kind of bifurcate. What Jackie was talking about was at the end was the political boundaries in terms of representation. And that impacts service simply by, um, you know, who the board member is, who their core constituencies might be, and their interplay with their colleagues on the board. Then the other topic that we've discussed related to this is not the board redistricting process, but rather the board boundaries and boundary process. And that's one of the things that um, RTD informs our board of directors about whenever a community is thinking of annexing in or de-annexing out of the district. And that is what impact might it have on our limited resources and service that's a consideration um so i'm trying to think when castle rock de-annexed it made our lives a little bit easier we no longer had to worry about providing service in fact we're not legally allowed to pick up or drop off passengers outside of our district boundaries so we could simply say no to anyone in Castle Rock, um, you're not part of the district, we're not legally allowed to serve you. Uh, on the other hand, when large new developments come in, they often are going to want or expect um, some level of service and type of service, and that can be very expensive and divert resources from existing services, considering that we have a set number of service hours and dollars to go around the district so if a, a large new development or community is talking with us about annexing in we will do a dollars and cents analysis in terms of and and a, a frank dialogue with our board and with that community as to what level of service or type of service be it flex ride or an extension of existing route or hey there's nothing we can do for you you're free to annex in. You won't have to pay parking charges at our park and rides um, if you're part of the district. Um, but it will be many years before the density and growth in your area warrants service. And so we have those discussions um, among staff and then with our board of directors as well as with those, those folks considering joining the district. Any other questions of Bill? Bill I, uh, I have, oh, go, go I ahead, have one more. Oh, Julie, you want to go first, then Elise? Question. Go ahead, Elise, with your question. I just have okay. a comment. Well, just to segue off that last point, um, it seems like there's two options if there are um, jurisdictions on the edge that might want RTD service. One is to expand the boundary. The other is to create more flexibility so that RTD can develop partnerships to, to um, serve jurisdictions out or to partner with other tra transit agencies um, that are running routes that are start outside the district and come in. I know that that has been an issue for us up here where the flex service that be, um, starts in Fort Collins comes south it goes to Longmont and into Boulder, we have not had as enthusiastic partnerships, shall we say, with RTD over um, allowing that service to stop at RTD stations and, and bus stops um, and, and partner in a way that makes sense given that 
a good chunk of it runs through RTD territory, but not all of it. And so I guess that's something that I would like us to explore more on. How do we, if we don't want to expand the boundary because it's already so big, how do we um, be a little more flexible in how we serve serve outside the, those boundaries or partner with jurisdictions outside those boundaries? I don't know if Bill has a response to that, but. I don't. I, I actually think from a staff perspective, can we just have a list of these things? I think Elise raises a really good question about things we want to continue to explore. It's a governance issue, and I think it's a really good one. Um, so can we just, Doug, who is kind of keeping track of those? Me. I'm doing okay. it. I, I wrote it down. All right. So that one I want to, I would love to see a big star next to. And the other one I'd love to see a big star next to is um, if the legislature arrived at 15 from 21 and <clears throat> don't know that there's a rhyme or reason there, I, I don't think we should feel, um, I'd like to also compel creating a smaller board because I do think there are, um, I, I'd like to understand what it would be like. I'm not saying I want to do it, but I, I just think having 15, um, and as we look at the geographic area, I am concerned as the West continues to become a larger geographic area, um, you know, to, to have that population, maybe some of the parochialism will be addressed or not, but to have these very, very, let's just say rural parts of the district, and then you've got like downtown Denver with that density, it's like, I feel like they compete against each other. I'd like to see representation that kind of identifies service for, for all of it and kind of cool. Not, not that we haven't. I just, I just think a smaller board may be a more efficient board. Thank you, Jackie, very much. Well, and, I think my, and I think my comment is really kind of taking off of both Elise and what Jackie was saying is one, how can we work better to provide service in areas that currently don't have service or are underserved? And then um, kind of um, on Jackie's point is what, what is it that we want? Again, I always keep going back to the, what is the problem that we're trying to solve specifically with this board governance question at hand? Like, do we want a board that is, you know, more responsive to local government? Do we want a board that um, could be held more accountable? Do we want to reconfigure districts so that um, constituents understand where they kind of fit in geographically better. Like for example, Jackie, I mean, I think you're in two districts. I mean, how does how do we consider like what 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 is it that we're actually trying to accomplish um, with this board? And then how do we kind of make our recommendations towards that? Thank you, Julie, very much. Bill, I didn't know if you had I saw your mic flash on, I didn't know if you had any further comments. But I think all those questions are fantastic, Julie, and I've, I've written those down. And I think, you know, as far as timing, the timing is pretty good with regards to, you know, any recommendations that we might make associated with those questions. And maybe we take them up at, as a, a full agenda next time. Any other questions of Bill? I see Lynn's on the call too. I don't, I, Lynn, I don't know if you had any comments. Being an RTD director yourself. You're muted. You're muted. As she there unmutes, I'm going to. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead, oh. Lynn. No, I, I don't really have anything to add right now. And I, I know Angie's on the call. I don't know if she has anything to add. Oh, yeah. Angie, you're, you're no, more than I welcome. Don't. Yeah, no, I, I'm good. I, you know, other than, you know, I was on the board in 2012 for the last um, um, redistricting. So <laughs> I kind of feel like deja vu. Here we go again. <laughs> right. Thank you. And again, Bill, thank you, sir, very much. Appreciate you doing that. I know it was, it was short notice and it's much appreciated. We only met last Monday. My word, I couldn't believe it that we were meeting again today. <laughs> but anyway, I... So, um, so the next agenda item is update on governance model. So I want to provide one update and one new model for, for your consideration. And I will send you some additional information on this. And I am in the process of creating a matrix, um, kind of building off the one that we had in the packet last time, but also Kathy kind of put the, 
the pros and cons in that as well, um, at least according to Doug Rex, the pros and cons of, of uh, the various models. The first one I wanted to give you an update on was the uh, Utah Transit Authority. You, you recall at our last meeting, uh, Bill Saroy, staff at, the, at um, R RTD, he had mentioned that the, the, the uh, governance changed at, at uh, UTA fairly recently. It was uh, used to be a 16-member board, part-time board, very similar to ours um, at RTD right now, but that was changed. Um, it was actually, it was, it was during the 2018 legislative session. They're a creature of the state like RTD is. Um, they revised, they, the legislature revised the, um, the governance structure of, of UTA. So they, it is now a three-member board, full-time board, which is appointed by the governor. And the, um, the Utah district, the, the, the three members, one serves the north section, the central section, and then the, the south section. Um, and it, it's interesting. So each county within the district um, can provide, it depends on the size and the population of the county, but they can provide, you know, up to, I think it was like five, um, uh, uh, not, not recommendations, what am I looking for, the word, um, nominations. They can nominate up to five, depending on the size. And then the, the, uh, the governor then appoints based on those nominations. So it's a three member board. Um, now there is also a nine member, what they call local advisory council. Now advisory council seems to be fairly similar to what the, the board used to be. It's made up of um, a county and, and local, local government representation. And the best that I can tell right now, I have a call out to my counterpart in uh, Salt Lake City, um, but it, it, it's like a, it, it appears to be like a recommending body to the board. But the, but the board itself is a three-person board of trustees, and they kind of, you know, they, um, they oversee the executive director and all that kind of good stuff. So I thought I would share that with you because that is very unique. And, um, and to, to the earlier question, I think, was raised by Jackie with regards to the size of boards. I mean, that obviously is one that's as small as you will probably see a three three-member board or a transit authority. The other one, the one I wanted to um, bring to your attention, and I wish I would send you some additional information on this after the meeting, is LA Metro. At the last meeting, uh, Commissioner Jones requested that we put uh, LA Metro on the list, and this was quite interesting. Um, so the governance, the actual board itself, is pretty typical, I think, in that there's there's 14 members, 13 are elected, or sorry, so 13 are are appointed, 13 are voting and appointed. And then the governor also has a non-voting seat on the uh, on the um, on the board. The uh, the mayor of Los Angeles, he is the de facto chair for for the committee or for the board. But what was different about this model, um, and it gets to some of our conversations late in the meeting uh, last time, as well as the some of the questions that um, that both Jackie and Julie raised today about um, you know the role of local governments, the role of communities having having input in this collaborative exercise, right, which is RTD, is that they have what they call um, regional service councils. And these regional service councils, they're composed of political appointees from various regions around, around Los Angeles County. So there's five county, sorry, there's, um, there's five regions throughout Los Angeles County. And these service councils, they advise on planning and implementation of service within their area. Um, they call and conduct public meetings and evaluate Metro bus programs in their area. So they actually have a, a, um, um, a governance arm or hand in deciding um, local bus service. Um, that, so that was pre pretty interesting as, as a model. I'm, I'm gonna explore this some more and I'm actually, um, going to reach out to someone at LA Metro to provide us a briefing at the next meeting just to just so you all can get a better understanding and ask questions and you'll get intelligent answers as opposed to asking me about this but it I, but I do think that it was a, it's a very unique model in that respect I've not in all my research I've not seen anything like this so so Commissioner Jones thank you very much for sharing it but I think it's a model that's worth exploring some more, right? Because it's it does seem to address some of the some of the questions that that have been raised in in uh, in previous governance meetings. Anybody have any comments? Uh, yes, Elise. 
Doug, thanks so much for checking into that. And, and credit goes to Kathleen Brackey on Boulder County staff for suggesting that model as being something that we might want to explore because of the partnership of the transit agency with the local jurisdictions and sort of the shared, perhaps shared governance. I'd be curious um, when you follow up with them, if you can explore an understanding, is there shared funding? Um, if there's any sort of a survey of how the local governments like that model is is it working and um and i'm curious too what the impetus for the change was were they encountering some of the same questions that that we're having with our current model so those are some of the things i think would be worth exploring great yeah no i definitely will at least um yeah that's it will and, and hopefully i can get someone on i know there's actually a, like a director of regional what are they call again Regional Service Council, so maybe I can get a hold of that person to, to give you guys a really good briefing on the concept. That's all I have for today. Um, is there anything else you'd like to bring forward? Any specific topics you'd like to address next time other than this maybe LA metro area idea? Dea. Yeah, no, thank you, Doug. Um, I think one thing that I, in addition to diving a little bit deeper into the LA Metro uh, model, I would like some insight into just how some of these governance structures interact with their community residents. I think it's really great that we're getting all this insight and in how they interact with our with local governments, rightfully so. Um, but I'm also just curious, how are they working with community that are writing the transit system and what is the perception of the community um and how their transit agency is working so i think if we can include that that would be great no Dave, that's fantastic i wrote that down and i, I will um, ask them i know specifically in the um uh, in the service council bylaws it makes a point of talking about the composition of the councils are comprised of up to nine representatives that live represent or work in the communities within the boundaries of the designated region they represent uh representatives of the msc may be elected officials or private citizens and this is the point i want to get to today is that and at least 50 percent of each council member uh, of each council member shall be regular users of public transit services so they make a point of in in their protocol to indicate that uh, that that obviously is an important aspect of this yeah i was really impressed by just some of the various um formalized committees that LA Metro has um, that seems to get at your point that they seem to have a, a lot of outreach and, and community involvement. Hey Doug, one of the other governance issues I'd like to understand and, and explore a little bit is um, some of the restrictions that the legislation has placed on RTD regarding use of RTD property, regarding, um, uh, and I apologize that I don't, uh, I assume I, I is it I don't know if it's the FTA or our legislators that have the fare box, the amount of revenue required to come from the fare box. Those uh, and there's probably and our RTD directors can probably speak to some of those other uh, um, more rigid restraints that are placed on their ability to be maybe a little more entrepreneurial in the uh, in, and actually seeing revenue come into the district and or. Um, how they can operate the district. So I know the fare box is an issue, and I also know the the what what RTD is allowed to do with the land that they own is also one of the restrictions that is placed on them. Are there others that I'm not thinking of right now that others know of yeah. that we should be exploring as well? No, thanks, Jackie, for that. I I know Ron Pastor just clicked on his video, so I know he has a comment. I think one of the other committees, subcommittees, are probably planning on taking this up, Ron. Yeah. Um Thanks, Doug. Mayor Belay, that's that that issue came up at the last um, finance subcommittee meeting as well. So at the finance subcommittee meeting on Wednesday, we'll be doing a quick review of some of the more directly related statutes to the finance issues to RTD, including use of property, development of property, and some of those um, statute statutory limitations and some of the others. So that definitely came up there. We're doing a statute review. We'll we'll start that on Wednesday. It'll be it'll take a little time to get through all of that. But that issue, the fare box recovery statutes, all related to sort of the finance issues for RTD. This is one of those 
issues, kind of the statutory limitations and authorities that have been placed upon RTD kind of cross, cut across several, uh, all three of the subcommittee um, areas of jurisdiction, absolutely. So I think the, the next full accountability committee meeting, will try to bring all of that together. And, and kind of that's the purpose of this structure is to make sure that there is that conversation going on and we're making sure we're hitting all those issues. That sounds great, thank you. Thank you, Rod. Any, Lynn, or, or Dan. I will let Lynn go first because I think she was unmuted before I was. Okay. <laughs> I just had my hand there, but I will say, um, I guess I was wondering, uh, Ron, I haven't looked at that finance committee agenda. Um, are, are you starting with a presentation about the statutes? What's the statute review looking like? Um, thanks, Lynn. Yeah, you haven't reviewed the agenda yet because it hasn't quite gotten out the door yet. We're hoping this afternoon it'll, 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 with, with any luck. Um, it's. I took my best stab at reviewing the whole, um, all of RTD structures in uh, Title 32, uh, Article 9, and really kind of picking out excerpts that seemed most directly related to sort of RTD's financial issues and financial structure and those limitations. It's not an exhaustive, it's the beginning of a conversation. So it's simply a staff memo with sort of excerpts of those pieces of statute to get the conversation started. Great. Uh, you know, I, I know that um, uh, we've looked at a lot of those and partially this last time with SB 151 uh, um, working its way through the Senate before it, it uh, got killed with COVID. But um, so I know that, that Bill Van Meter and Bill Soroy uh, have done a lot of work on all of those. And, and uh, Jennifer Brandeberry, um, our public affairs and lobbyist person, um, has been working on some of those issues for about 20 years. So she also could be a a good resource for you or for the committee. Yeah. Thank you, Leah. Okay, I was ahead. just gonna thanks, Doug. I was just gonna jump in and say I know this is probably more in line with the finance committee's work, but I mean my understanding was that RTD does have some transit oriented development that they're able to do. I think it gets back to you know Bill's presentation around land use, right? And this those communities that are further further east and maybe on larger properties and the, where the density doesn't necessarily um, support this kinds of this kind of transportation that we've been traditionally talking about and I think getting us to a little bit more creatively um, but I, I guess this is more of a question for you Bill <laughs> um, my understanding is that TOD does exist within RTD and that you all have been looking at ETOD in different ways or I know Ron I, I think you and I have had that conversation in the past as well. Yeah, it's a little more nuanced than um, simply asserting or stating that RTD cannot develop. Um, there are a number of federal regulations and state law, but we definitely have the capability to accommodate TOD on our land. And I'll also add there are legislative restrictions on parking as a revenue source. Yeah, thanks. And Bill, I'll, that that's really good. And I'll supplement that a little bit just because it's fresh because I've been looking at it over the weekend. But there are some there are authorities for RTD to do development sort of at or around their stations and on their property for sure. But there are also some important statutory limitations on what they can do. And some of it is, you know, they can't they can't pursue a development partnership on their property if it will directly compete with a private business in the vicinity of that. So that that automatically sort of put some limitations on maybe put the highest and best use of the property. There's limitations on the impact that development might have on reducing existing parking at those sites. So, you know, there there are some statutory limitations to what RTD could do to maximize sort of the use of the land that they might own around a station, for instance. Those are the things that I think the Finance Committee will start to dig into a little bit. Got it. Thanks, Ron. Thank you. Doug, could you um share um, to, with the committee members after maybe with the minutes or whatever the sort of running list you have of issues that you want to explore i i feel like i might have brought up stuff in the past and i don't want to be redundant but um and and also it's uh, sometimes it's which subcommittee is dealing with stuff gets a little bit blurred but um i know i've brought up in the past sort of the um local government uh, local government partnership model um mirrored after sort of the uh, regional sub-regional 
concept that we've talked about and um i just want to make sure that's on the list and uh you know maybe the sub-regional model could even look a little bit like dr cog's tip process which we're we're so well, excited and, and proud of <laughs> No, it, and it definitely is on the list, at least. I was actually thinking for the next meeting, if we could get someone specifically from LA Metro to give a presentation, and then I will bring to you that full list of questions that we have. Because I think we're far enough along now that I, I think we know the direction we're kind of headed in with these things. So we want to make sure that we're addressing all the questions that have been raised associated with. So I, I, will, I will provide that list to everybody next time. Thanks. Sure. Mr. Jones, it's we've we've started sort of a tracking sheet actually councillor murillo from aurora kind of gave us a template early on we've been we've restructured that a bit and we're starting to use that to track all these things so um we're just sort of doing a final review to make sure we've caught that we've captured everything so far but our our idea is we'll start sharing that kind of the latest and greatest version with each of the subcommittees and the full committee so you can all see what we've captured make sure we've got it captured and kind of report on status of uh, what we're doing uh, with those requests or those conversations that have come up. Great. Great. Thank you, Ron. Okay, we're at 454. We got anything else for the good or the order today? No? All right. Um, well, not hearing any. I guess we'll adjourn. So I do know that the next governance committee meeting, oh, gee, I say, I say that. Um, I think it's after our full uh, full committee meeting, although I'm not positive about that either. Melinda, do you know off the top of your head? Uh, off the top of my head, no. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I meant to check and I totally forgot. But I will send out to you guys today, I'll, I'll send out to you just some links on, on the LA Metro about the, the service councils, just so you have that. And Bill, if you can send me the, the night, I guess, what would that be, the 2012 map? Um, I'll be sure to provide that as well. Actually, it, actually the 2002 map. Yes, that's right. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, right. The next governance committee scheduled for the 19th from 4 to 5. Okay. October 19th. And gotcha. Mr. Jones alerted me to the fact because of the Columbus Day holiday, next Monday, the full accountability committee is currently scheduled for the 19th. I know there may be a conflict there, so Doug and I will talk about any alternatives for, for that one. Okay. Thanks for that. Good. All righty. Anything else? Is it going to be order? All right, everyone. We'll have a wonderful evening, and be sure to cheer on my Kansas City Chiefs tonight. That's all. That's all <laughs> I ask. Kansas City. What? What? At least uh, I forgot. Bye. <laughs> See you and guys. On that note. <laughs> have a great one. Bye.